Hi, thank you for tuning in to my sixth Q&A video. Uh, it's great that you guys have so many questions and comments on my videos and I think it's kind of fun to uh, answer all these questions. So uh, keep them coming. If you have a question, then uh, leave a comment on this video or send me a message on uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter or uh, Instagram and uh, I'll see if I can get to it in a later Q&A video. In this video I'm going to talk about eight note swing feels, so different kinds of swing feel for different situations. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you can make more Jesse sounding lines with uh, arpeggios and uh, also about if you are not really playing bebop what do you actually have in studying bebop and why do you have to study it. Uh, then I'm also going to ask some questions about the first songs that I learned when I was trying to play jazz and uh, about my education. So let's just get to it. Do you remember what songs you first worked on when learning to solo over changes? I remember when I first started playing jazz a year ago it seemed impossible, but now it only seems difficult. So I don't really know what tunes I played the first times I really tried to play changes because um, the first things that I had got where I had to play over changing chords were, uh, I'm pretty sure, were um, sort of examples and small vamps that I got from my uh, electric guitar teacher. And um, he just recorded uh, stuff that he'd made with a synthesizer um, onto a tape and then I improvised over that. And um, I don't think I really got that far with that, to be honest. Um, it was just the beginning, but I was also still, at that time, more interested in, in well, Hendrix and blues, mostly. And the other thing was interesting, but, but uh, it didn't really take, I guess, as I wasn't until later. And then the tunes that I remember sort of really being groundbreaking, where I really learned something, was um, about the actually about the time that you're talking about, like after a year. So I'd already been playing a lot and I could pretty much fake my way through some standards and I had some stuff I could play but most of it was not good and every other line I would play would be not would not really work and, and there were all sorts of problems. I don't remember how it sounded really but I just remember that I wasn't happy with it. And um, then I had a period of I think two months or something where I was uh, staying at my aunt's house and she was almost never there uh, over the summer so I spent really a lot of time, I decided that I wanted to learn some songs better uh, and then I took two tunes that I wanted to work on and uh, and just played those every day just to get some more freedom and, and actually really play something that I knew was right and that worked and just explore it like that and the two tunes I chose at that time were not really wise choices because they were way too difficult um, but um, so that was There's No Great Love and um, Stella by Starlight and especially Stella is just really way too difficult but it did help a lot, I mean I recorded the chords on uh, tape, it's a long time ago, you had tapes and um, and then I just soloed on them for an hour or so every day and anyway I was, the only thing I was doing was really playing guitar anyway so at the end of the period I was also starting to transcribe lines, I learned uh, most of a George Benson solo and I learned a Pat Martino solo um, and uh, two Uth Vakenu solos, but that was also because I was just hanging around there not really doing anything except playing guitar for um, two, two and a half months. Uh, and of course during that time I really learned those tunes and I had something I could play and then it got easier to play other tunes. I think the whole thing about putting it together and um, um, I mean in the beginning you can sort of figure out some stuff that works, you can just take sort of the basic chord notes and, and, and try and get it to work. I couldn't really analyze standard yet, so uh, I had to sort of guess and go by ear a lot um, and and that was also helpful, I mean then you just have to explore and you, you have to try and figure it out and you know that some stuff you can't really do well by ear, you can kind of hear like ah it's not really what it's supposed to be but I don't know what it's supposed to be so it's what I have and uh, that kind of thing is it's probably also healthy because you, you're just aware of okay I need to change this later and uh, in that way then uh, and you, you, um, you're sort of gearing for learning more and you also want to learn more because you can figure out like okay I'm at the limit of what I know here. So, so those two tunes, uh, I wouldn't really recommend doing that. Um, I'm not sure what I would recommend exactly. Uh, I think a lot of people say Autumn Leaves which is a good tune to start with. But um, And that is good in many ways. It's very diatonic. It can be nice if, if you don't have really good ears for diatonic harmony, depends on where you come from, um, then you can maybe take something that's changing a bit more clearly. Um, so um, 
something like uh, Green Dolphin Street or um, I don't know. Uh, well, actually, Blue Boss has also a better example for that. I think it's easier to to uh, learn, and then just stick with it, uh, and don't do the. I would say don't do like the so what and all that stuff because then you have to have a really good sense of period, and probably at the time where you're at, if you start worrying about what notes you play, you you're losing the rhythm all the time. At least that's my impression of how that went. Um, so modal tunes are hmm. Maiden Voyage is good, you know. Actually, that Abersold, um that's like a beginner Abersold number something, fifty something, which has a lot of good tunes. It has the Impressions one, which I think hmm, yeah, is, is maybe not. Fantastic, but uh, but I will go for those. Jens, did you attend a music college or did you learn from private teachers? If you went to a music college, what was your audition process like? Great videos. I did study at a music college. Uh, I have a master's degree in jazz guitar from uh, the Royal Conservatory in uh, The Hague, uh, where I also work now. And um, uh, I, did, um, I chose to go to that conservatory because um, I found out that, uh, well, there are two reasons. One reason is that I'd already had another education. I had a bachelor in mathematics, and uh, I was therefore a little bit older, and um, that made it really difficult for me to get accepted to the conservatory in uh, in Copenhagen, because it's it's anyway really difficult to get in, and they basically told me, well, there's always going to be somebody that's younger that's just as good or better than you, so uh, we're not going to take you. And uh, that then I uh, decided that... Um, that I wanted to study, and I was pretty much just looking at how much money I had and uh, uh, how long an education I could do, because I'd, I could also go to Berkeley, I, I thought about doing that, uh, but I could not do like a whole um, a whole degree there, I didn't have the money for it, so, um, and I didn't really f figure out that I could also ask for a grant or something, but I didn't know about that, so, um, so, so I saw the, so the conservatory in Holland, I went there for um, some Barry Harris workshops, uh, and there were already some Danish people, and I heard a lot about it. I had uh, a lesson with uh, the main subject teacher there, uh, so it seemed to suit me really well, and that's why I did the entrance exam there. So the entrance exam, uh, in itself, was stressful. Mostly, I can only describe it as being a lot of stress. Uh, the way, and it's the same now. You come in and you play some tunes and. Uh, uh, and you also have to do uh, a theory exam and uh, stuff. I think the exams in um, the entrance exams in Holland in general and certainly in The Hague also are not that elaborate. You don't have to do really a lot of different things. Uh, but of course, if you're doing audition somewhere, then um, then that's always going to be tricky. You have to show up with. Uh, well, what happened for me at least was that I just showed up with sheet music and then I had to play. Um, uh, play three pieces with um, with a band that I didn't know, and uh, of course that's a stressful situation. Um, and I, for the rest, I don't really remember. I don't really re remember how it went uh, uh, in uh, in the playing and the audition itself. I think that was just because I was so stressed about it. Um, but yeah, I got in, and then um, I did first a bachelor and then a master's degree there. Uh, in terms of whether you should. Maybe just to talk a little bit about that, um, because um, I also already had a lot of private lessons. Like I also had lessons with the guy teaching at the conservatory in Copenhagen, uh, and I learned really, really a lot from him also. Uh, and I've had a lot of really good private teachers, uh, because while I was preparing to get into the conservatory, I, I just took lessons with a lot of different people, and I, um, and I was not doing anything else except playing guitar. So I had a lot of time. And I could have lessons from several people at the same time and, and still cover everything. Uh, and of course, in a conservatory, you also have different subjects, uh, for different teachers. And a lot of it is private lessons. I think the main advantage for um, for getting a degree is probably also network and being around people who are also trying to get better and being challenged and not so much the lessons themselves. I mean, you learn a lot in the lessons but you also just get a period of time where you can work on getting better uh, so that you... Um, and maybe you actually have to learn, work on that process also. I guess I did that a bit. Uh, and I'm still doing that. So you have to find an efficient process for improving yourself and keep on working because that's what you need to do, hopefully, when you're done. 
I think nobody is going to stop practicing. Uh, and it may be a long time since I had lessons. I did, did take some lessons when I was done also. Uh, just because I want to have input from other people sometimes. And otherwise I just ask the people I'm playing with. I'm, I'm fortunate. I get to play with a lot of good people. And uh, uh, a lot of them I'm also just asking what they think, you know. And sometimes you don't... Sometimes you get sort of a neutral, polite answer. And sometimes you get some real feedback, you know. And uh, I think that's the sort of thing. So the, the thing with that, um, I can get into more about really what the use is of, of getting a degree in, uh, in jazz guitar is is going to be because it's very there, there are various um, things that are that but I'll maybe do that I think I have a question on exhibition like specifically on that that I'll try and do later so for me I just I did a master's degree uh, I've done some some summer courses also um, and I did a preparatory school in Copenhagen uh, and a ton of uh, private lessons before so yeah I've sort of done all of it how can I improvise pretty melodies with arpeggios what do I have to do to make it sound as jazzy as possible? I guess I have to sort of interpret a little bit what you think uh, jazzy means, because jazzy can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And um, I, I kind of have to go with a little bit my own association, which is sort of more in terms of bop and uh, um, yeah, pretty sort of bop oriented, like hard bop, bebop type lines with arpeggios. Uh, I know that I do a lot of lessons where I talk about how to use arpeggios when you're improvising because I think that's a very strong tool to learn the song and also just to play sort of basic melodies and um, and give you something to work with melodically that that uh, that will sound connected to the song and to the harmony and uh, that's true you need to be able to do that I think that's a good exercise I still do that myself also with with pieces I'll pick up pieces and just play solos with arpeggios just to to sort of dig in, and you can usually find something new when you start doing that, at least that's my experience. So, of course you need to work on that, then you need to add other things to it, because the average jazz solo is of course not only uh, arpeggio notes. So you need to see the arpeggio in a context, and you need to uh, use that context, and you also need to maybe, so the first context I would say is you need to see it in a scale, so that you have the arpeggio and then you have like diatonic uh, notes around them that you can view as being um, extensions or uh, diatonic passing notes. It depends a little bit on how you use them, I guess. And um, probably if you're in the sort of hard bop, bebop thing, then you also need to work a little bit with some passing notes and chromatic approach things. And um, so there we have a skill set. So we have the arpeggio, we have the arpeggio in the scale. We have some chromatic passing notes. And then of course you have to play it with the right feel. That's another thing as well. Uh, so you need to play it with a type of phrasing that's, um, uh, that sounds jazzy. Because you can actually play a line... Uh, you can play a Charlie Parker line, which is almost like the definition of, of a bob line. But if you play it wrong, it's going to sound like a misunderstood shuffle or something like that. So, um, so phrasing is an important thing. And you of course also just need to work on, on your ability to make melodies. Um, um, I think if you look at my lessons you can see that one of the ways that I work a lot with that is different kinds of arpeggios and inversions and triads and stuff like that because then I have different groups of notes that I can use um, just to have more ideas and they all have like specific sounds and I kind of like them to have not... I don't like to just take a chunk of a scale, I'm, I tend to have more like that note, that note and that note in the scale because then those intervals together is a melody uh, and that works well when I'm trying to compose lines. So that's something you probably want to do uh, as well. Um, okay, so if we try and demonstrate this, this is, this is a tricky question, it's kind of fun. Um, let's take a C7, because that's easy. And um, so we have C7, and um, we have the arpeggio, of course. So if I play that uh, from here. down to the C really but and um, so the first thing you can try is to see how jazzy can you actually get it to sound you have an idea about what sounds jazzy to you hopefully uh, otherwise you need to work on that and then you need to go find things that you think sound jazzy and see if you can copy aspects of it um, but you need to give yourself room to do that so if you're playing only with an arpeggio then don't expect it to sound like uh, you know I mean like a parker line or something, because it's it's going to be 
it's going to be different for that, but you still have to sort of think about, okay, what's the feel? So if we have this... arpeggios is that if you're using it in a sort of static situation then the only the four notes is gonna make it uh, difficult to make something interesting and you immediately start at least I start to feel like oh I want to do something rhythmically across the bar line and stuff like that but still so we have that so that will be some lines that ju are just using the arpeggio when you play this I would say focus on feel and on, on the ideas that you have so watch out that you're not playing I mean you have to take it further than So it has, you have to kind of feel what you're playing. In general, you need to feel what you're doing and, and give it some uh, some energy in terms of what you uh, what you're trying to get across. This is very vague, but so when I'm sliding up to a note, I'm not really thinking about it as a passing note. I tend to think of passing notes as if I'm doing something like so they get a rhythmical value if I'm just doing it's just a phrasing thing so it's a slurring thing more than it's really a passing note just people always ask so that's why I'm just explaining that so we have um, still just the arpeggio giving it some intent working on that then it's a C7 so probably we should see that in a F major context. If not directly F major, then at least it's the F major scale, and you want to think Mixolydian, whatever sort of works for you. Um, and then we could get something like. starting to use just the rest of the scale uh, and all these kind of phrases I mean I think I learned some of them from studying um, probably from playing like like uh, solos that I'd all written out myself or etudes that I got from my uh, teachers uh, and studying some just to get so that's why you kind of study uh, other solos you want to build some repertoire and you want to use bits and pieces of it Notice that I'm taking like a slow tempo where I can play, where it sort of sounds nice and it's easy to get it sound nice. I don't have to worry about technique. You want to eliminate all the other things when you're trying to make melodies. And then the other thing that I spend a lot of time doing and that I still spend a lot of time doing is just coming up with lines. So instead of, like now I'm playing in time, but um, if we have the scale and then the arpeggio, then, then probably you want to spend some time just see, see what you come up with um, and, and take any sort of simple idea and then make a few lines with it because that process is what you want to use when you're improvising. So, playing in time, I shouldn't be actually, but you can hear like, I'm starting with that, that phrase, and then I'm just making different endings on it, and trying to get it together with a lot of other stuff, and this kind of exploration you want to do, um, it, actually I'm demonstrating it wrong by doing it in time, because I don't think I do it in time if it's something I don't know, so I'll be the only thing that I have now is that I know I'm playing eight notes, so I'm still even if I'm playing rubato, I'm sort of still going like 1, E, N, E, 2, E when I'm making the line so that I know where I am in the bar because otherwise you get all these lines that are like 9 and 5 uh, 8 notes long and you can't fit them in there and stuff so you kind of need to pay a little bit of attention to that and of course later when you improvise you, you need to break it up differently but just for now when you're trying to get familiar with it 
um, I don't count, but I, I'm still aware of that it's like... You know, so it's still, it's still going from strong beat to strong beat. Um, and then, yeah, so take a simple phrase and make some different endings on it. Uh, look for material. Uh, I mean, there are tons of, of written out solos that you can you can start sort of going through. Learn to play them, um, and then uh, uh, then then you can try and see if you can steal bits and pieces of it. I think that that's a good uh, way to approach that. So that was let's see. So now we have the scale. This is going to be really long. And then uh, we have the scale and uh, the arpeggio. So we need some passing notes. So. So of course there are like this thing with the bebop scales that, that uh, I probably already said in a, a non-subtle way that I'm not a huge fan of bebop scales. Um, so to me I just think passing notes, there are so sort of different phrases that you can use to as, as a chromatic uh, approach to, to something. So if I have my C7, whoops, C7's uh, the 50 G, so... Then I have a few different ways of doing that. So I'm just adding these chromatic notes, I'm not really thinking about it, it's not becoming a scale to me. Um, the major scale worked well for all classical music and all the people who wrote the standards, so that works well for me as, as well. Um, and, uh, and then all the chromatic notes are just chromatic notes and we can put them in there when we feel like it. So if we start doing that, uh, again, same idea actually as before, like I already started adding chromatic uh, passing notes in uh, in my example with a so um, so I guess you just you just pick something and then then you can choo choose like if you do that one, which is a nice one. It's like a really long way to get to G. So. and you take it out and you try to make some lines with it, keeping the sound of the C7 in, in mind. Uh, and in that way I think you, you know, sort of develop. So it's a combination of checking out repertoire and trying to also take stuff of, out of what you're using uh, and then putting that into use. Uh, and then just, uh, yeah, composing. It, it can be a good idea to actually compose lines and write them down because if you write them down then you can much easier say, well that note is not good or if I put that arpeggio in that place it doesn't work but if I move it an 8 note it works better or, I mean there are all these sort of things where you, you're not gonna it's gonna be difficult to figure it out if you're only hearing it and playing it especially if you're only playing it I mean if you're listening back to recording you might have a shot at it but if it's written out it's easier to just judge and figure out what's going on and maybe you can then try and fix it so for that I think writing down music is, is uh, superb actually um, and it's very useful to write your own stuff out and, and um, I think for this you don't I would not really transcribe yourself so as much as just try and compose lines and try and play them and then see what they sound like it's always different if you if you try and write them of course you can write them with the guitar there but at the same time if you really have to just play through them slowly and it's like a whole chorus you learn a lot from that besides the reading um, and you just learn to, to work on your ability to come up with good lines and, and I think I think it's something that's not talked about as much as you should in, in jazz education, that composition is really a huge part of uh, improvisation. At least this for me, and for also from what I see with a lot of students. It would be interesting to talk about the swing feel, how do you approach it, and the various comping situations when playing duos with a combo or with a big band. I know it's a lot of stuff. So this question is in fact just the first question in sort of a small conversation that I had with uh, Tassos if I'm saying his name right, um, on Facebook. 
uh, because I kept uh, asking a few times a little bit to figure out what he exactly meant with it, um, because the different settings yeah, w uh, and the swing feel. Uh, I don't think the setting is really determining the swing feel. I think the style of music that you play is determining swing feel a lot more, if it is even doing that. And um, it turns out that what we ended up with was that it was more about the eight note swing feel in your lines than uh, than it was about the comping that he writes here. So I'm just going to talk about eight note swing feel in lines uh, because it's important and it's difficult and it's vague uh, as a topic. So uh, that's always fun to talk about. And um, you probably know if if you're a beginning jazz guitar player, um, then I think you'll find that, uh, or if you hear somebody who is, that uh, I know I certainly played like this, uh, that if they have to play a blues in C, then they sound like this. Which is, um, uh, I'm obviously overstating it uh, for dramatic effect. Uh, and that works, that kind of phrasing works well uh, if you do it a little bit better and you're like... If you're a Stevie One or something, then I mean, then it works. But you have to play it like that, then you don't play lines like what I just did. Um, but yeah, that's of course not the nicest phrasing. So the thing is that we get taught very often that swing phrasing is triplet phrasing. Um, so that means that when you're playing eight note phrasing, you're playing uh, that kind of phrasing. So your eight notes are so the first and the third triplet uh, in the in the beat. And if you listen to records, then you'll probably find that that is almost never the case. And if you do, it sounds not that well. Um, and also uh, another thing is that you kind of need to to change the. Um, the emphasis in your lines, so you couldn't play So you need to have the, the accents uh, away from the beat a bit. But if you overstate that, then at the same time you're immediately going to and turning into a shuffle. So um, this is a subtle thing because that means that if it's not rhythmically exactly triplets, then it's somewhere in between. And it's not really well defined what it is, and yeah, that's hard to explain and it's hard to practice. Uh, I think the best thing you can do is actually just to um, well, there there is there are a few things you need to do, and it's it's really a process. It's something um, like I think I quoted that before. Jim McNeely once told me um, that anywhere between the, the, the anywhere between 140 and uh, 90 beats per minute was tempos that people who did not have 10 years experience in playing jazz should not be allowed to play because it always sounded like crap. Um, and exactly, that, that is this. Of course, if you're a beginner, you kind of need to play those tempos because you can't handle the slower and the higher tempos yet. Um, but, but that is true. Those are the sort of difficult tempos where it's very difficult to get the swing right because you have to be quite precise and everything has to lock together. And those are the things that you do not connect with um, with people who are beginning, yes. So, different types, um, I'm going off, off the topic here, so uh, different types of swing. Um, I mean, it, it's a matter of how even or how, um, like how big is the gap between the, the, the note on the beat and the one that's off the beat. And if you check, you can even just listen to guitar players and hear quite a big difference in in how much they, they do this. Uh, typically a lot of the older guys will tend to swing a little bit harder and the more modern guys will tend to play a little bit more even. Uh, I think the first one that's usually credited with really playing even eight notes in the guitar players is uh, Pat Martino. Even though he doesn't do it all the time though, but, but it does get more and more even the further you get. Uh, I think I've seen um, uh, Jimmy Rainey credited or actually explaining it somewhere that it was supposed to be even. Um, and the other, the other one I've heard people talk about how it's even is Clifford Brown, um, which is also kind of early for that. So you want to keep it, especially when it gets faster, you want to play more even. 
And here's where it gets tricky because um, Maybe let's just try and demonstrate this in, in a medium tempo first because that, that makes more sense. The fast tempos, it's kind of logical that you want to play it more even because if you keep really having two of the notes really close together, it's going to sound funny. It's, it's not going to sound fluid and it, it's going to, you have to keep the notes, um, give the notes enough right, each of them. And if you make one of them really, really short, which is what you will do if you play really fast and you play triplet swing. Uh, then that's almost going to disappear, and that's not what you want to emphasize. So there's something completely wrong with with that idea, which is also not what we do. We just tend to play more and more even the faster we get in, in tempos. So um, yeah, C7 blues in uh, in C. Um, so if you play, I think for me it's like when I work on this, I I I first had to of course learn to play more even. And then I think I actually have started to go a little bit back to playing more triplet because I'm a little bit better at it. And I started looking for it and I'm much more working on on, on trying different kinds of swing in the groove and, and see what fits with whoever I'm playing with and how they interpret swing and stuff like that. And it makes a difference uh, and it can be really useful to check that out and be aware of it. So the first thing you want to do is you want to train your ability to hear it. You want to find recordings that you know you can hear a swing, so try to avoid stuff where people are rushing, for instance, uh, because there are a lot of early guitar players that tend to rush a lot. Uh, so um, I think the clearest examples that I would go for would be uh, Oscar Peterson trio, something like that. Um, they're really swinging um, quite well most of the time, pretty much, even when they play Boston Overs. So, um, so maybe find find sort of examples of that and, and try and listen to it and get an idea about okay how's it supposed to sound. Um, I think like the video I had with the different um, my top five classic jazz albums, if you check out also George Benson is also swinging and he's not rushing. He might be a little bit in front but he's still not rushing. So he can be a really, really good example of somebody who has a certain type of, of swing. Um, and also... Um, there's like a Joe Pass album on there, and it's not all, in my opinion, it's not all Joe Pass albums that are that great and that swinging, but that one is really good. I think that's one of his best ones. Um, so that's also a good sort of, a, sort of uh, example of where you can hear it, and then you need to get used to hearing it and hearing the different kinds and recognizing it, and that, that takes training. That really is actually the biggest part of it. Once you have that, if you can hear it, it's a lot easier to execute. Uh, but the thing is, the learning to hear it is vague. Um, it's just listening for it and then being aware and you want to learn you probably want to hear if people are in front of the beat or behind the beat or on top of the beat uh, at the same time see if you can get used to registering what that is that's very useful to be able to hear that also for your own playing um, and also that takes training and I think I think a lot of people are not that good at that so if you work on that and then um, so then now we get to the different kinds to see if I can actually demonstrate this or maybe everything just sounds the same especially on the video but uh, we'll try um, so if you play something that's a little bit more um, this style was sort of pretty pretty overstated swing or pretty heavy in the swing It's a little bit like the way I do that. I'm, I'm probably choosing a little bit of phrasing that emphasizes it. So if I play that a little bit more even, That's 
completely even. So now we have sort of three, three different things. We have a... Which is almost going towards the shuffle. And then you have this sort of thing, which is more like... Well, to me anyway, it's more like a sort of modern mainstream kind of thing. But also probably close to what you would find with Wes, I think. And then you have like... Having the ability to sort of do the different things is it's good. It's not going to be depending on what setting you're playing in. It's going to be depending on who you're playing with and what you're playing. So um, the first one is going to be more count basy, uh, and and the second one uh, is probably going to be more um, if you're in the I don't know later like sixties kind of yes things and also just if you're playing standards with people now I think it's not always gonna be really sort of the the heavy groove driven. I think the first one is really sort of swing as a groove, trying to emphasize the groove. Um which is nice if if you have people who can do that and actually swing. Uh and then you have sort of the different variations with uh how how even it gets. Um I don't know, I'm curious because I have to look at the video to see how uh, how clear the different uh, sounds are on a blues and C. But those are sort of the different ones, and then you wanna you wanna f the first thing. So yeah, working on this is the first thing is find examples of the different things that you wanna learn. So listen to some Oscar Peterson playing medium, uh, and listen to uh, other people playing medium, and register what kind of swing they're using, and see if you can hear it. Get used to hearing it, uh, and then try and see if you can copy it. Uh, not you don't have to tra transcribe the solo, but just put on the metronome and two and four. I should have done this with a metronome actually, um, but um, yeah, just just try and, and copy it and see how it feels. You need to record yourself to hear how big the difference is, probably. Um, but it is about sort of logging in, you know. I mean, uh, and you will find that there are people who use. I had a discussion about this with a bass player the other day, also. Um, that sometimes you can even go further back than triplets, so you're not even playing like, but you're really playing. Which has a certain kind of drive. And I think the example that came up with this was Christian McBride who plays like that. on how you do it, of course, it's going to sound more sort of like a shuffle or more like actual swing. That, um, so yeah, swing is, is sort of a huge, vague thing that you have to work on, and, and the main thing, for me at least, is just being able to hear it. If you can hear it, you can reprodu reproduce it e a lot easier. You probably need to be able to hear it to play it at all, uh, and just hearing it is already difficult. Um, and the thing that actually messed with me for the most part, and that's why I'm saying that, is that people didn't tell me that if you listen to uh, um, well actually if you listen to a lot of Barney Kessel or uh, uh, Talthalo and guys like that then their timing is sometimes rushing so much that it's kind of hard to hear what they're doing even though they're rhythmically their ideas are good how they're placed in the groove is, is not that strong for this compared if you compare it to somebody like, like Oscar Peterson and Ray Brown um, and also Jim Hall who's not playing so many lines but his timing is also always just solid, so uh, for that he can be a good example as well. Uh, yeah, so this is a long story with uh, some examples and it's kind of vague, but uh, at least I hope it helps a bit. So my question for you that I hope you might like to cover in an upcoming Q&A video is what insights are to be gleaned from bebop that are important even if one doesn't want to play bebop? I know about the various devices one can use, bebop scales, which is mostly a way of hitting chord tones on downbeats and scale tones and upbeats, chromaticisms, enclosures, but still I feel like I'm ways off from having a real understanding of the unique insights of bebop. Is this because I'm not comfortable enough playing fast lines over complicated changes, or is there more to it than that? This is an interesting question, because it's of course, a lot of people will tell you that you need to, to work on, uh, on the tradition to understand and be able to play jazz, um, well, and probably you will get told that in other channels as well. At least I would also say that if you want to play blues, you do need to know 
what Moriwara sounds like and what Howling Wolf sounds like. Um, and then why is it that that's useful? I think um, actually the things that you're mentioning, like bebop scales, I, I don't really spend any time on. I don't think that's very useful. Uh, and my concept of it is the same as yours. It's like it's an organization to keep the chord tones on the beat and stuff like that. And I like to think that if I want to have the chord tones on the beat, then um, I actually can do that without having to practice a certain type of scale. Um, and using chromatic passing notes and stuff like that is of course part of the language and that's useful, you learn that in Bebop but actually I don't think that that, that is what you really have to learn from practicing Bebop, at least I can only answer this of course from what I try to learn from it and why I keep coming back to playing it um, and maybe I'm not even strictly playing Bebop I, I mean it's Bob oriented but it is, it's as much hard Bob as it is Bebop because yeah, well, we don't really have that many guitar players who really play bebop. It's a little bit like Charlie Christian was too early, and uh, Barney Kessel, when he's playing with the bebop guys, is not that strong. He's better when he's later, and maybe he's not playing bebop. Maybe he's playing hard bop. Uh, and also some of the stuff he does, maybe that's more swing. So that's, of course, these things. That's just questions I ask myself. Um, so yeah, so so there are not that many guitar players who play bebop. So in that way, I mean, I checked out uh, a bunch of Parker, uh, and uh, well, and actually that's almost it. I checked out a little bit about Powell and some Elmo Hope also, but it's not a lot. Uh, so it's mostly Parker that I checked out for for bebop stuff, um, and for the rest is later what I checked out. But I think the point of it is that you wanna, what you wanna learn if you're checking out bebop is that. Uh, you get a, a good affinity with playing over changes. So it's really about playing uh, melodies over changes and using uh, the material from the harmony in, in your solos. It also means that you have to be able to understand that harmony. So um, it's not about just being able to play the changes and, and, and have sort of a chord scale relationship, but you also, I think if you ask people who are good at playing bebop, they, they take it a bit further. At least I know a few people who are really good bebop players and, and sort of in the traditional sense that they really know how to play real bebop. Uh, and they're great to play with for that because they just have this sort of really rich language on top of, uh, of, of standards that, that uh, I find completely fascinating. Um, and it's coming out of the whole like uh, um, bop tradition. So and that makes me go back and study it also but I think for me the, so the thing is more like really understanding the harmony and playing the song um, and um, it's also um, an approach to still being able to change the course in a certain way so it's a common language of reharmonizing while you're soloing um, so it's a little bit like a higher level than what you're talking about actually because it's, it's like you, you have to understand the structure of the tunes and the different functions of the chords because these the songs are not jazz songs, their uh, bebop tunes are usually built on standards and they're, the standards are written by classical composers so there's a classical theory that describes it better than whatever chord scale theory they came up with in Berkeley in, uh, in the 70s or whenever they did that um, so it, you need to understand it like that um, and uh, then I think there's also a level of interaction that I think, um, besides the harmony, but also just, just the interaction and the, the ability to um, improvise over um, or in a group setting and, and reacting to each other, which is not so present in hardbop, but it's more present in bebop. But there is really is a big part of it. Um, so I think those are the things. I don't think it's so much like. Of course, it's like my personal opinion on this. I like listening to Parker, and I can go back and listen to Parker and get inspired by it, and and, and take stuff from away from it. Maybe I, I don't exactly transcribe it, but I'll still keep it in mind, and I really like it. Uh, and I'm still working on playing standards. Uh, and if you look at the the people who are sort of the influential guitar players, well, actually the influential musicians right now, then they are also all of them also playing standards. So so the the language out of that's coming out of these compositions is so rich that that you keep going back to it and keep working 
uh, with exploring it to to sort of get better at playing over changes and um, and that's a lifelong process I think and I think if you don't have that um, you might be losing something like there's a common ground when you're playing with other people in terms of what kind of reharmonizations you can do and what fits and um, and sort of having this this common place where you're coming from even if you're playing completely different music makes it a lot easier to keep things together um, both just like keeping it together rhythmically and not screwing up the form but also just keeping the the music together and being able to communicate um, like uh, if you play something and even if you're in a different groove if you if you are if you're able to play something that signals the bass player and the drummer like now we're going from two to four and, and you do it in the way you play your solo um, that means that you can use the same kind of language if you want to have a, a similar kind of effect in another groove and I think those are the kind of things where you learn to do that in the in bebop stuff uh, and then um, you take that with you when you're interpreting and playing other kinds of music so I think if you're if you're talking about that level because earlier in the question more than I what I quoted here you're talking about how Papanthini says that everybody in his band has to be able to play bebop but his music isn't really bebop um, which I don't know I mean a lot of Papanthini's music is actually bebop it's just bebop with fast with a fast samba feel or something like that I mean so so I think he demands that I think now that I say samba feel I think he also probably expects people to be able to play uh, rhythmically certain things uh, I think what's not so often covered in bebop is that you have to be able to play like something that fits over different grooves so really play like a samba or, or and also solo in a samba th feel stuff like that, that kind of came later but I think he would probably also ask that of, of the people that he played with given the, the nature of his music and I know that I also almost expect that from the people around me I think that's like a level on top of it um, that that I just take for granted I don't no, I don't take it for granted but I notice if it's not there that's for sure when I'm playing with people that if they can't really play on a groove um, and what I mean with playing in a groove is just relate what you're playing so if the groove has a has a forehand don't go sit on the one too much anyway or do it in the right way it, it's vague but yeah so these kind of things and if you're and it's similar if you're missing the the bebop thing um, besides just having having it like a technical level, I don't think it's really like so much a technical thing that you have to play fast on top of changes. It's, it's more about um, just being so deep into improvising and being able to have a level where you can hear changes and play changes um, and, and, and also can, can put it onto your instrument. Uh, it's going to give you sort of a common ground when you're improvising that's that's needed for for playing other kinds of music in a jazz style as well and I think if you so that's what you need to take away from it um, it's difficult if you don't love it if you don't like music if you don't like Parker then then that's that's uh, tricky to really want to delve into that um, and I don't know I suspect that somebody like Holdsworth did not spend a lot of time playing standards. I know he did play standards, and he did check it out. He did listen to Parker. He did listen to Wayne Shorter and Coltrane and stuff like that. Uh, but he made his own thing out of it. And of course, it's possible, but it might not be the easiest way to do it. Uh, and it might be worthwhile to check out other people uh, if you want to play stuff like that. So look for pop players that um, that you do like, and then check them out. And it doesn't have to be Parker. It can be other people. There are. There are lots of good uh, Bob players around, uh, and also I would say like extended take, especially as a guitar player, you need to do that a bit. So you, you should take take a look at the later guys like uh, Kenny Burrell and uh, uh, Benson, Papatino, Jimmy Rainey, and of course Wes. So that was uh, some attempt at answers to uh, some questions. Uh, I hope that it's at least vaguely clear what uh, I'm talking about. I like doing these videos because they're kind of spontaneous and uh, well improvising is something that uh, I think is fun to do obviously and uh, also when I make videos and um, uh, of course that means that some of it is a little bit unclear and I have to come up with it on the spot and uh, um, I hope that I'm not more confusing that, uh, than uh, I'm helping here. Uh, if there's something that's unclear you can of course just ask me 
uh, and leave a comment on the video. And if you have any other questions uh, that you want to have an answer to that maybe I can cover, uh, it could be anything about uh, guitars, strings, gear, harmony, um, or just the stuff that, uh, that I also covered in, in this video, so more about playing and uh, studying music, uh, then leave a comment. And of course, if you see a comment with a question and you think, well, okay, I actually know something about this, then uh, be sure to comment. Uh, it's nice to get another point of view. Uh, as you can tell also in this one, I'm really interpreting what I'm making out of the questions. So maybe I, if you see it differently, uh, I actually learn a lot from seeing how you, how you interpret these questions and what you think is the essence of what's being asked, because it can be a lot of different things. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a uh, value. There are a lot of people who are watching these videos, who are experienced players, and uh, uh, who um, who have something to say. You know, uh, really have information that is of value, uh, and uh, uh, so share it. That's that's useful for everybody. Uh, if uh, you want to help me continue making these videos, then uh, check out my web store. I'll link to it here, of course. Uh, maybe that's something that you can use in furthering your studies. Uh, and that's certainly a way that you help me getting the time to do these videos. Uh, so yeah, and if you have a question, of course, leave a comment on this video or um, connect with me on uh, social media. So uh, I think especially Facebook is useful for asking these questions and I can also just get it back a little bit with uh, if I want to clarify for myself what, what you're actually trying to figure out uh, so that I can actually try and answer that and not whatever I might think it is. Um, and that's about it. New lesson on Thursday. See you then.